After almost a month in space, China's Chang'e 4 lunar probe has successfully landed on the far side of the moon. It has started lunar exploration and already sent back pictures of the landing site. China launched the Chang'e 4 lunar probe on December the 8th. With a lander and a rover, its key mission is to explore the far side of the moon, the side not visible from the Earth. So what's the significance of the Chang'e 4 mission? What's likely to be learned from it? And what are China's next steps in space exploration? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Yang Yuguang from the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation and Mr. Nazir Mahmoud, Director General of the External Relations and Legal Affairs Department of APSCO. We'll also speak to Mr. John Mankins, a former Chief Technologist of Human Exploration and Development of Space at NASA by satellite in Washington, D.C. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Pandong. But before we get started, let's take a look at this. It's an ambitious plan to land a probe on the far side of the moon. But China's moon exploration goals are beginning to be realized. Chinese people have always placed hopes and dreams on the moon. Going there is a realization of a thousand-year-long dream. China's moon exploration started back in 2004. The project was divided into three phases, circle, land, and return. In 2013, the Chang'e 3 landed on the moon. But the Chang'e 4 probe was given an even more challenging mission, to reach the far side. It is of human nature to explore unknown places in the world. It is also the underlying impetus for the development of science and technology. That's why we chose to go to the far side of the moon among all the choices we had, even if it means we will face more challenges. So I think our moon exploration endeavors will not stop. Instead, they will continue with great devotion and long-term plans. It has only been a decade since the moon exploration project began in China. The achievements that have been made so far also carry the dreams of a generation of young space scientists and engineers. And for them, the path ahead for China's space exploration is at last becoming wider and clearer. So, gentlemen, the rendezvous point of our discussion is the far side of the moon, also known as the dark side of the moon. For the past 45 years, the term is mostly coined by Pink Floyd's 1973 album. But now, it's time for hard science to take over. Let's start with a simple but philosophical question. Why do we go there, Professor? Uh, well, you know, that exploration of the moon is very, very meaningful. Uh, by uh, sending orbiters or sending landers to the moon, we can have a better understanding of the evolution and history of the moon. And so you know that because the Earth and Moon, and moon forms a uh, so-called uh, astronomy, the Earth-Moon system. So studying the moon will be very important for us to have also a better understanding of the evolution and history of the whole solar, uh, solar system. And so we can have a better and uh, precise prediction of the de de uh, destiny of human beings. That's mm. very important. Mm. So uh, uh, in this procedure, you know that because, as you mentioned, the, the moon always facing us on the near side. So we cannot see from the ground uh, have direct Im images of the near side of the moon. S and and uh, another reason is that uh, the, uh, the terrain and also uh, the rocks on the surface of the near side of, uh, of the moon and the far side of the moon is quite different. So uh, although we already have orbiters orbiting the moon, which can see uh, and get images of the far side of the moon, but uh, we, it cannot replace the importance and role of the on-site exploration and also uh, uh, as, uh, yes, the, the, the landers is very important the, uh, to perform the on-site exploration. So it is the, I, very important to have a soft landing uh, mission on the far side of the moon. Uh, we haven't done that before because it is too difficult. Right. What's your take on this, Mr. Mahmoud? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the Chinese nation on this wonderful achievement uh, because uh, for 50 long years, uh, this side of the moon uh, was undiscovered uh, and there was no landing attempt, although there was a crash landing over here uh, in the past. But uh, this is a moment of jubilation uh, for the Chinese nation and also for uh, the humanity. Uh, right. 
Yeah. So, uh, the Chang'e 4 lunar probe has already uh, started working and uh, sent back a uh, very first close-up photo of the d uh, far side of the moon. And uh, our viewers could also take a look at those uh, photos. So, uh, gentlemen, what can we learn from the first photos from the far side of the moon, Professor? Uh, actually speaking, we already have photos taken from the orbiters. Uh, but you know that uh, the orbiters, because uh, orbiting the moon at least at uh, uh, about 100 kilometers uh, the, uh, the, the, the altitude, so it can, uh, cannot have very fine, uh, very high resolution images of the terrain of the moon. So from this image, it is the first time in human history to have a so fine resolution image of the lunar surface on far side of the moon. And from this kind of uh, Im uh, images, we can see that it's really different from the near side of the moon. Uh, so uh, you're saying that it's very important uh, for a uh, human to send probe to the very surface of the far side of the moon and it's impossible for operators to take photos and to analyze further. But what about spectrum analyzing? Even with that technology, we still have to go there. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Uh, these, uh, with some of the payloads on board the Chang'e 4 probe, uh, I mean the lander, and also some of the uh, instruments on board the, uh, the, the, the rover, uh, we can have multiple uh, informations. I mean, uh, you know that we have the uh, low frequency spectrometer. Uh, which will perform radio astronomy on the far side of the moon. You know that uh, originally the Chang'e 4 is a backup of Chang'e 3. Mm. Uh, but after the successful uh, of the Chang'e 3 mission, the, uh, the CNSA or the China National Space Administration changed the goal of the Chang'e 4 mission to the far side of the moon. So some of the payloads also, also were, re uh, were replaced. Uh, we have the low uh, frequency spectrometer and also we have the uh, neutron and uh, uh, dosimetry uh, measurements to mm. test the uh, and we'll radiation. go through all those mission details yeah. step by step later in the program but uh, Mr. Uh, Mahmoud would you call this a big step forward for China's lunar exploration? Definitely but uh, before that we need to understand that uh, there are three phases of uh, Chinese uh, lunar uh, program uh, first was the orbital uh, access and uh, thereafter the, uh, that was achieved by uh, um, uh, Chang'e 1 and uh, Chang'e 2 mm. and uh, thereafter the second uh, phase uh, completes uh, with the uh, landing on the uh, surface of the moon uh, that was completed by uh, Chang'e 3 and uh, Chang'e 4 and the third uh, and the final phase would be to collect samples uh, and uh, retrieve samples uh, from the far side of the moon and uh, that will be done uh, through Chang'e 5 and uh, Chang'e uh, 6. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will uh, complete the uh, three phases of uh, the Chinese lunar mission. So uh, once they reach the far side, uh, which is uh, hitherto undiscovered, uh, so this will uh, give a very big leap to the scientific missions in the uh, future, uh, for future probes and for future, uh, I mean, uh, access to uh, the other planets and other asteroids. And yeah. Professor, earlier you called this a very difficult mission to land on the far side of the moon. And, uh, for a common people like, a common person like me, I can partially understand it because China has to first launch a relay satellite called Chuechiao to get a signal out of the far side of the moon and beam it back to Earth. Uh, I believe this is only a part of all the difficulties. What are some other major obstacles? Yes, there are also other difficulties and challenges. You know that, as I mentioned, the terrain of the surface of the near side of the moon is quite different from the far side of the moon. Uh, the most of the mares or the seas, uh, we call the, the lunar seas, is on the near side of the moon. It's really flat. On the far side of the moon, so it's, uh, there are more mountains and the, more, the, the shape is more steep. So uh, this time we change the, we, and optimize the landing procedure of the Chang'e 4 probe. Uh, probe. This is from the engineering view. This is some of the major difference from the Chang'e 3 and the Chang'e 4 mission because this time the landing itself becomes more difficult. So let's get more international perspective on this and let's cross live to Mr. John Mankings in Washington DC. He's the former chief technologist of human exploration and development of space at uh, NASA. Well, Mr. Mankings, thank you very much for joining us. Right after Chang'e 4's successful landing on the far side of the moon, NASA Administrator uh, Jim Bridenstine sent his congratulations to China and he called it, and I'm quoting, a first for humanity and an impressive accomplishment. How do you interpret his message?
Well, of course, uh, I, I share uh, in offering his uh, congratulations to China. It is a wonderful accomplishment. Uh, and uh, to do something for the first time, uh, whether it's the first uh, uh, landing on the moon or the first landing on the far side of the moon, is an accomplishment that will go down uh, in the history of uh, not only humanity, but uh, humanity in space. So uh, I, I interpreted uh, uh, Jim Bridenstine's uh, comments as, um, uh, as just the uh, uh, sincere offering of uh, appreciation and congratulations for what's been accomplished. So how do you and your U.S. peers view uh, this landing? Earlier we just uh, saw pictures, the first close-up of photos of the far side of the moon sent back by Chang'e 4. What more are you expecting? So I think the, um, uh, the observations made a few moments ago by your other guests about the scientific opportunities in studying the moon are, are all, uh, of course, true. But in addition, uh, the moon represents a tremendous resource that over the coming decades uh, may be uh, developed for the benefit of humanity. Uh, and I think the, uh, this uh, first landing on the far side of the moon, uh, which uh, might in fact uh, be a place where we could build large uh, telescopes uh, to study the universe uh, and to land near the south pole of the moon, uh, where it's believed there may be resources that would be valuable in uh, both the development of the near-Earth space and eventually going beyond the moon to further explore our solar system, uh, this is a great accomplishment. So I think uh, this mission, uh, and including as it does a very interesting uh, life sciences payload, uh, this mission is a great step forward for those goals. Uh, tell us more about that life science uh, experiment. Uh, what's the purpose of it? So the, the, the immediate tactical purposes are, are modest. Uh, it's to uh, study uh, whether or not the uh, plants can grow in, uh, uh, in the, the low gravity of the moon and uh, whether or not, uh, as I uh, uh, understand the experiment, whether or not uh, silkworms uh, can uh, uh, thrive. Uh, but uh, even though it's one small initial experiment, uh, it is a first step towards the longer term goal of establishing uh, a, uh, a small biosphere, a, a sort of an island Earth away from the Earth. Uh, so I think uh, it's a small scientific payload, but its strategic implications are tremendous. Maybe it also has some um, personal significance to you too, because earlier Professor Yang Yiguan just told me that you are the Vice President of the Moon Village Association. So this could be also a quite a big inspiration for you too, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the Moon Village Association is an international group uh, which is uh, promoting uh, international cooperation and collaboration uh, in establishing uh, humanity on the moon, both uh, human activities with robots uh, as well as uh, in the longer term uh, human presence uh, and, uh, and we hope settlements. And so this experiment uh, with the life sciences and sort of establishing a first uh, amount of data of uh, life on the moon is quite important. Well, Mr. Mankins, we'll be getting back to you on this. And uh, Professor Young, let's go through details of this mission. Earlier, you, you've already talked about, uh, you know, uh, survey the terrain and landforms, detect the mineral composition and shallow lunar surface structure. But according to Xinhua, there will be uh, some other missions. For example, conduct low-frequency radio astronomical observation. Quite a mouthful. Tell us in plain terms uh, why it's so important. Uh, you may see that uh, from the shape we can distinguish from the Chang'e 3 and the Chang'e 4. Chang'e 4 have se several very long antennas. These antennas are the what you call the low frequency spectrometers uh, because you know that on uh, far side of the moon it can uh, block all the disturbance from the Earth. The radio waves, uh, you, know, you know that we have very large uh, antennas on the Earth uh, to study the radio astronomy, to, uh, to study the uh, electromagnetic signals from the, uh, from the stars, from the galaxies. But you know that uh, the disturbance from the Earth is really a problem. Mm. So uh, even on near side of the moon, we cannot block all these kind of disturbances because the moon is a very big celestial body. So it is possible on the far side of the moon, uh, all the disturbance from the Earth 
the all the radio waves are blocked. So it is possible to have a very clean background, and we can have this kind of uh, radio astronomy studies. And moreover, we also, you know, that's this program, I mean the low frequency spectrometer program, is a cooperation between China and the Netherlands. On the Netherlands, they will also have some uh, very large antenna uh, radio telescopes and cooperate, cooperate with this uh, radio spectrometer together to form a very long baseline, more than uh, 400,000 uh, kilometers, and this this can uh, form, theoretically speaking, a very large aperture uh, device uh, to have more detailed studies on the astronomy. So uh, what about another mission? Measure the neutron radiation and neutron atoms to study the environment on the far side of the moon. What can that tell? Exactly. Uh, we have the neutron and uh, the uh, dosimetry uh, on the lander, and also we have uh, neutral detectors uh, or uh, spectrometers on the on the rover uh, to study the radiation on the uh, lunar surface, especially on the far side of the moon. We we'll, you can recognize this as a very good start and preparation for the future works, because as as John Mankins has mentioned, we have scientific goals and also we have engineering goals. For the engineering, the far side of the moon is very meaningful because on the far side of the moon there are permanent sunshine areas and also permanent shadow areas. In the permanent sunshine areas, it's easier for us to est establish a permanent base which can have uh, continuous uh, energy support because have the sun sunshine. And also the thermal control problem will be very easily solved. Uh, on the shadow areas, there are ice water so uh, we can have the uh, water supplies in the future. This is very critical for the permanent base on the lunar surface. So uh, first things first, we study the radiation environment on the surface will be a very good reference for the future potential manned missions mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and also very uh, useful for the future other robotic missions. Mm. So uh, Mr. Mahmoud, when a country uh, makes uh, such a big step forward in space uh, technology, is it common practice for it to share it with the international community? Uh, the space cooperation is uh, uh, not a choice. Uh, it, uh, I mean, it has to be done because the space is so vast and the technologies, uh, uh, almost there are 100 technologies that are involved uh, to, I mean, uh, construct the uh, space technology itself. So therefore, uh, the cooperation uh, between many nations bring together uh, uh, the technological uh, uh, database and uh, technological basis of all those countries and the talent is uh, pulled up. Uh, and that also evolves the space technology very quickly. And we have the examples uh, from the past uh, US and uh, uh, USSR uh, time uh, uh, during the Cold War. Uh, there were many technologies which were uh, ultimately evolved uh, because of that uh, sort of space competition uh, during that time and uh, because there were many nations cooperating with the, both the blocks, so therefore the technologies, they emerged very quickly. So I find that uh, the space cooperation uh, through uh, multilateral platforms and through bilateral uh, uh, cooperation also, that is a key to a quick evolution and uh, uh, making the cost-effective uh, technologies uh, for the future exploration. So from your work experience, has China been a, a firm supporter of this kind of multilateral effort? And has China been sharing? Definitely, because uh, uh, I come from Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Organization and we have uh, got about 11 member countries in our organization and China being uh, one of the uh, member states. And uh, uh, because uh, uh, within our member states, uh, mostly uh, they are developing uh, countries, but uh, uh, among those developing countries, China is by far the uh, most uh, strongest uh, uh, in terms of space uh, exploration and space technological uh, holdings. Hmm. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, China is a sort of big partner or uh, a sort of very uh, effective uh, member, it has shared many resources with all our uh, other developing countries and the member organizations of uh, APSCO. So uh, from our perspective, China has always uh, been very uh, generous in extending the uh, support to all the uh, member states of the organization. And also at uh, different other forums also, uh, China has always uh, uh, 
promulgated uh, and propagated uh, cooperation, collaboration, inclusiveness, and uh, uh, I mean uh, multilateral cooperation. And Professor, let's look forward a little bit. Uh, another mission, Chang'e 5, uh, will be happening in 2019 if everything goes well. And it will aim to bring back the first rocks from the moon since the Luna 24 mission in 1976. How difficult would that be? And will that be the ultimate purpose of China's lunar exploration? Well, you know, that's, uh, although <coughs> the, uh, the U.S. have performed a Apollo program which have manned uh, sample returns from the moon, and also the former Soviet Union have the robotic uh, sample return missions before, the lunar 16, 20, and 24 uh, in 1970s. But uh, this time, we choose a quite different way. Uh, to some extent, the procedure we, uh, we performed on uh, Chang'e 5 will be very similar to the Apollo program, because we will, first we will have an uh, orbiter, uh, and we will have a lander and also a sending vehicle and also a sample return uh, capsule. Uh, Just to be clear, that will be happening on the near side of the moon, right? Yes, uh, the first uh, Chang'e 5 mission will be uh, performed on the near side of the moon. But I believe sooner or later in the future, uh, there will be have some, some sample return missions uh, to the far side of the moon because uh, that's very meaningful on scientific research and also very meaningful for the future engineering. Right, so will China send a human to the moon? Uh, the leaders of China Aerospace, including the leaders of China National Space Administration and those from the industry, has expressed this wish to have the future uh, manned lunar missions uh, in the future. Uh, but we still, we also have already performed some preliminary studies and uh, have some, uh, some projects on the key technologies. But the whole program, program we are still waiting for the uh, approval of the central government. Right, for more insight, let's go back to uh, Mr. John Mankings in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Well, Mr. Mankings, is sending human to the moon the holy grail of uh, lunar exploration? Because so far, the United States is the only country has done so. So I think uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, sending humans to the moon is, is, uh, uh, is, a, is a mountain to be climbed. It's a goal that uh, many uh, spacefaring countries aspire to and I personally I believe that uh, China will accomplish this but uh, I have to I have to disagree slightly and say I don't think it's the holy grail uh, I think that uh, the real holy grail uh, will be uh, establishing a permanent uh, presence on the moon uh, I don't know what uh, they call it a base or something or an outpost but but some kind of permanent human presence on the moon uh, to me, that's more the holy grail, because then uh, humanity is truly uh, a multi-planet species. But why didn't the United States uh, do so with the technological know-how? Uh, what's the main reason here? Is it not cost-effective? So in the 1970s, if you, you think about the level of technology of that era, uh, uh, it was very, it was not, not cost-effective to continue uh, and establish a, 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 an outpost or a, a, a permanent presence on the moon at that time. Uh, however, uh, if you look at the advances in technology, uh, particularly in uh, robotics and uh, electronics, in materials, uh, in launch technology, uh, all of those things have progressed dramatically over the last 45 years. So I think the prospects for accomplishing this in a cost-effective way are now much greater. You have been saying that uh, moon exploration space programs are a mission for the human race, but we know that space technology is mostly about one country's indigenous innovation and technological capability, and, but like it or not, it always requires international cooperation at some degree. But under the Trump administration, we can see that it kind of uh, takes a hostile attitude towards scientific exchanges with China in uh, space uh, programs. What do you make of this situation? Is this a lose-lose situation for the international community? Well, th I think there will always be, uh, uh, between countries, there will always be uh, areas where their national interests uh, are in some degree of conflict. Uh, and I, will think there, I think there will also uh, always be uh, uh, times and uh, topics where cooperation and collaboration become essential. Uh, so uh, I think uh, just now uh, there is a fair amount of um, uh, disagreement on some key economic issues, for example. 
Uh, but I think this will not stop uh, the cooperation between uh, uh, China and the rest of the world uh, in the U.S., Europe, uh, Russia, and so on, uh, in uh, proceeding with the, the exploration and development of the moon. Uh, so uh, let's talk about this uh, space command set up by the Trump administration. Uh, do you think the United States is trying to militarize the outer space? I, I think it's more analogous to the situation um, uh, some decades ago when, uh, uh, so when uh, aviation first entered uh, the uh, U.S. industry and the U.S. government, uh, it was uh, uh, within the U.S. government largely a matter for the uh, post office and for the, uh, the U.S. Army, uh, but eventually it was necessary to form a separate air force. Uh, and, uh, of course, at the same time, commercial aviation took off. Uh, I think similarly, uh, now we are at or near a transition where there is so much activity uh, that uh, attaching space to other parts of the U.S. government and uh, in particular parts of the U.S. military uh, is, uh, is something that some people within the uh, U.S. policy community think should be changed and to have a separate space force. Uh, I do not believe that that uh, represents a, uh, a step to uh, militarize space, but rather that it's just such a large topic now and such a, uh, a growing commercial sphere uh, that uh, there needs to be some uh, high-level uh, government organization to oversee it for the U.S. government. Thank you very um, much, At least Mr. that's my view. John Mankins in Washington, D.C. So, Professor, uh, former... China's senior leader Deng Xiaoping used to say that science and technology constitute a primary productive force. So realistically speaking, putting aside all those scientific pursuits, do you think uh, space exploration is all about a country's core competitiveness in technological arena? Well, actually speaking, the ex uh, space exploration, especially the manned space programs and this kind of deep space programs uh, have little direct returns for the, for the national economy. Uh, but you know, that's the technology transfer uh, from this kind of, there are many examples in these kind of technology transfers which can benefit. You mean the, to civil use? Uh, yes, to civil use. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, these kind of projects can promote the, 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 the entire level of the country on basic science, on basic technology and arts. So uh, is this kind of uh, projects is really very important, not only for the scientists, not only for the engineers, but also for the whole economy. So, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, what about the international perspective on this? Do you think uh, the international community, community has reached a consensus that exploring space is a necessity for most of the countries, if not all? You see, uh, space provides a sort of way of life, uh, if, if I may uh, say so. Uh, so this uh, way of life uh, uh, is also a trillion dollar uh, economy. So it has a lo uh, lot many benefits for the humankind. If you uh, but see... But it could also mean a tr tens of trillions of dollars investment and uh, few countries can afford it. No, but that is what I'm saying, that uh, for the past, uh, uh, if, if we can uh, divide the era for economic uh, development, before 2000, all the GDP of the world combined together was going in a level uh, sort of, uh, I mean, uh, line. Yeah. But suddenly when the space uh, came into, uh, uh, space went for a big leap and mobiles and internet and all that uh, infrastructure developed, so suddenly the graph rose sharply at 90 degrees, mm. almost. So that is uh, what the benefits uh, so of So you're saying that w are. whatever happens on Earth, it's always necessary for human beings to yes. look beyond the sky. Thank you very Indeed. much, gentlemen, for your input. And that's it for this edition of Dialogue on CGTN. I'm Pan in Beijing. Bye-bye.